Have you ever tried to stream while working on music? It's an absolute nightmare most of the time. It's a time. <laughs> <laughs> And I've been wanting to make a video for a while now on how to do it a little bit better. What I'm going to show you is how I do it, some alternatives of how to do it. This is going to be kind of like a hardware specific, Windows specific tutorial, but you might learn some stuff along the way if you're just generally interested in this space. This video is really going to be helpful for anyone who's wanting to combine audio and video in any kind of advanced way without getting stuck into the limitations of some of this streamer specific audio equipment that's on the market. There's lots of amazing gear right now. This is probably the best time to be a streamer. But what I find is when I look at a lot of these audio products is that they're very limited. They don't really allow you to do things that a normal studio environment would allow you to do. There's a lot of USB microphones. There's a lot of interfaces that don't give you much control, but let you do simple stuff really easily. And this stuff's all great. What it doesn't do is kind of gel easily within a normal studio environment. And I know that musical streaming is bigger now than it's ever been. It's still not the majority of streaming. So I want to talk to you about some products that I use that make this whole process way easier. Either way, there's a few things that just aren't quite obvious that hopefully just learning some of the terminology in this video will help you with. This video will also really help you if you're using some software methods to kind of get around these difficulties, but you're not particularly happy with how they run or if they're a bit buggy or any of that kind of stuff. And also, if you just are like me, you like watching other people talk about their workflow and the ways that they manage to do their things and the passions that they have, I think you'll find this interesting. My name's Mike Mallion. I'm a drummer for the band Monuments. I'm also a session musician for progressive metal bands mainly. And I'm also an educator and streamer. So I'm gonna show you how I do what I do and hopefully it will help you out. So I'm gonna run you through a bunch of scenarios on how we can capture the audio in a really high quality way without thinking too much about it while we're focusing on the video or the streaming environment. I will be using Antelope audio interfaces in this video. These are what I'm using to actually achieve some of these techniques. And while you can learn from it, you won't be able to apply these so easily without actually getting hold of one of these yourself. But I do recommend having a look at this and taking a look at them because they're making some of the most high quality devices on the market right now. And they don't really get the recognition they deserve for providing such an amazing feature for streamers. So I'm really stoked to show you how that all works. The particular interfaces I'm using are the Orion Studio Synergy Core. This is my primary interface. This is what I use for pretty much everything. I'm also using a Discrete 8 Pro Synergy Core. This is my secondary interface, which is not necessary to have, but I use it as an extra set of eight preamps that I can digitally control. I really love working with both of them, and I'll talk more about that as we go on. Once we've worked out what we're trying to achieve, I'm going to show you exactly how to do it as well, so don't worry about that. So here's what we're going to be looking at today. You can click on to find any part of this video that helps you for your specific needs, or you can just watch through the whole thing, whatever works best for you. For now, let's just dive straight into it. So I want to go into a bit more detail about why I think that this is such an important video to make, and why I think it can really help a lot of you out there. I have had no end of problems trying to stream while making music and while collaborating with other musicians and even while just trying to share fun collaborative streams with guests. It's just been really difficult for me. I've found that the way that I've wanted to capture things just hasn't really existed and the tools that are available, they work on some concepts that just are a little bit broken, a bit buggy in their core. Let me explain where the source of this issue really comes from, in my opinion. There are two different audio systems going on at work. Whenever you're listening to music in Spotify, or you're playing a game, or you're talking to someone on Zoom or Skype, you're using the operating system's audio protocol. And basically, this is just the easy to use, easy to chop and change and use lots of different devices protocol that lets you listen to music and sounds just very easily. But that's not the protocol that we use when we're making music in a DAW. For that, we're using something completely different called ASIO, A-S-I-O, and it stands for Audio Stream In and Out. It's actually made by Steinberg originally, who make Cubase, which is the DAW that I love using. So this is a separate audio architecture, and it allows for a lockdown process 
for certain audio interfaces, only a single one to basically use. And anything that's going on in that world is just unable to be seen, used or manipulated by the operating system's audio infrastructure. And this is why when you make music in a DAW, it's not actually that easy to take that audio and throw it into a live stream using software like OBS, which is what I use, or to share that in some kind of conferencing program like Zoom or Skype or Discord or similarly. It's basically not compatible. It is invisible and you have to find some way of bridging that gap. And essentially, we don't tend to think like this. If we're just trying to make music, we think, well, we can hear it. Why can't I record it digitally? And it's just because there's this fundamental difference between the two. Let's just say, for example, you wanted to combine those two worlds. You want to play music through your computer, you want your stream to have some sounds that you can hear and the stream can hear, and you want to have some kind of live DAW feed going. For example, mixing a song, making some music, playing some music, performing and monitoring through a DAW. This is a very normal setup to want to do, and it's not so easy to do it. So. We've got a few options with how we do this, but essentially what we need to do is capture what's coming out in a way that can be recorded and sent in. As far as I knew, before I learned about the Antelope devices, the only way you could do that was to plug the output of one audio interface into the input of another one, and then record that and hope that you can hear that. This is cool, but you only get to hear the one mix. You don't get to make any choices about what you hear and what the stream hears, and that is a big problem because you don't always want to hear the same thing. You can work with that limitation, but I prefer to think about well, what if I want my audience to hear something else? Or what if I've got a guest on and I don't want them to hear their own voice back? Because if I'm capturing me hearing the guest, how is my audio, how is this mic getting to the guest while I run a stream, while I record this stuff? How is this all splitting out? And this is a big problem. How do you do that? So you could have multiple outputs going into multiple different inputs of two audio devices, but the monitoring of that, like that's a cluster. Like it's getting difficult and you've already got enough to worry about while you're streaming or recording. You kind of want to slim this down a bit. So I kind of used to use a sort of hybrid setup with that where I would a Behringer monitor controller, which I could record the input of. And it did work for a while, but I, I ended up getting sick of it. It didn't work so well for me. It got me started, but I, I wasn't so happy with it. So the only other options you have are to sort of jerry-rig your DAW audio into your Windows infrastructure somehow. There are a few software things that we can basically use to get over this, but I really don't like using them. I only really use them as a last resort because I find them to be a bit buggy. Um, one of them is called Voice Meter. It's a series of programs made by VB Audio, and some of their tools are amazing. I do use some of the simpler tools, and I'll show you a bit about them in some more advanced workflows. Essentially, they make something called Voice Meter, which allows you to mix audio interfaces, mix inputs and outputs, and even has some kind of ASIO bridge built in, but I haven't been able to make it work successfully. It's only produced buggy, noisy audio streams for me, and it's ruined more streams than it's helped me succeed. That's not to say it's not possible. I just haven't enjoyed the process at all, and it's killed my creativity more times than I can count. The only other tool that I've found to work is called Rearstream, and this is a plugin that comes free with the program Reaper which is made by Cocos Audio. This is a really clever plugin because it can take your audio stream uh, via a VST plugin, which runs inside your DAW, and it can throw it over the network, either locally within the computer or to another computer on your network, and I think even over the internet. And then another instance of that plugin, which you can open in OBS, can then take your audio feed and make use of it. Those methods will allow you to pull this off to some degree, but there's a lot that can go wrong. They don't always work really well. And I just don't think that's a really viable long-term solution, uh, at least as soon as I found the alternative that was Antelope Audio. So the main features that make this loopback system work so well for me is that in their advanced interfaces, like the Orion Studio Synergy Core and the Discrete 8 Pro, you can send anything anywhere 
you have a bunch of mixers built in so that you can build mixes that you can listen to directly without having to monitor things through a DAW at all. There's an audio driver that allows you to have four different stereo playback devices and four different stereo recording devices, which is the absolute key to how this loopback works because inside of the software mixer that Antelope provides, you can send anything from those playbacks to those recordings and any of the mixes in between. And on top of that, you can also use a whole bunch of effects built into these interfaces. This is one of the best things about it. For example, you're hearing this mic with a bunch of effects that Antelope are actually providing. You're hearing it in this way, but I'm also recording it completely dry. I'm recording two separate audio versions of this, one with and one without any effects. And I'm also recording the full mixes of what I'm gonna show you later at the same time. Again, I am gonna get into the whole two computer, two interface system later. I'm just explaining for now that that's how this video is being captured and that there will be some cool nuggets of info at the end for anyone who's interested in that kind of a hybrid setup. The other things that made me really want to work with these Antelope devices is that they have full-blown network control. Um, all the preamps are digitally controlled. So as a self-engineering drummer, being able to hit the drums and actually gain them in while I'm at the kit is just so useful. The only other way I could do that is to have the rack of preamps next to my drums. And then that means the computer's gotta be close to that, which means the speakers have gotta be close to that, which means the desk. And it, how are you gonna fit all that stuff next to a kit? It just, it's, it's ridiculous. The only way I've been able to do it in here before I got this stuff was to have the desk was facing down the room this way and the drum kit was there so I could literally hit a drum while I'm turning the knob. It is, it's so stupid. Um, it's really hard to do and uh, doing it so often in here, I definitely got a bit sick of it. So I really wanted to optimize that. The preamps sound amazing on these devices. They are world class as far as I'm concerned. They're clean, they have great dynamics, they sound awesome. The input and output converter quality in this is nuts. I don't really understand the black magic that's going on in there, but I do know that I'm hearing details in my mixes and other mixes way more than I ever have done before, and everything I'm capturing digitally just sounds awesome. There's a big leap between everything I was using before and this, and I've noticed that across the board of all the Antelope devices I own, including the Zengo, which is their entry-level device, which can also offer all this loopback and stuff. So I'm really impressed by that. So here's a few scenarios of what I tend to do in here. What I may well have is background music playing at any point. I might have a guest that I'm talking to live. I will have streaming audio like alert boxes, uh, pings when someone follows or subscribes, and along with that, like sound effects that are triggered by my chat where they wanna play like a fart or an applause across the whole stream. I might also want my guests to be able to react to those sounds. That's what I'm able to achieve with this setup, and I don't know of any other way I would be able to do it without having the tools that I have. So let's run through that one step at a time, how I build this up one step at a time and why I'm doing what I'm doing. And this is gonna be focused entirely on how to do this with the Orion Studio Synergy Core at first. We'll look at how it works with the Discrete 8 later, and I think I'm gonna do a separate video on how to do this with the Zen Go down the line. So this is what my interface looks like from a software point of view. This is the control panel for the Orion, and it looks a little bit crazy, but you'll get an idea of what's going on and why this is such a cool way of bridging everything that can come in, everything that can come out, and throwing it into all different sorts of places. I have, on this interface, 12 preamps. I'm using them for a variety of things. You can see here I've got an input for my DI inject for guitars, bass, usually it's bass. Then I've got this talkback mic, and then from mics three upwards, it's all the stuff coming from the other side of the room. And so to keep that clean, I actually just run a couple of stage boxes that have XLR inputs, and then they run through D-sub cables up to my desk where they break back out and go into the XLRs. So those are made by Diodario. They're called the Modular Snake System. Really great products, I love using them. They've cleaned my studio up so much. So I've got preamps three onwards, are basically drum mics, and I don't have enough preamps 
for everything I want to capture. As you can see, maybe here I've got the drum talkback mic, three different kick drum sounds, two different snare drums, three main tom mics plus a floor tom sub mic. And then I use a second interface for this, but you wouldn't have to. You could do this with any ADAT expanding preamp, you know, eight preamps into an ADAT cable because uh, the Orion has ADAT. For the sake of you seeing what I'm seeing, this is the control panel window for the discrete eight. And here are the preamps one through eight for the other microphones that I have, including spot mics, overheads, room microphones. And then I also save the front inputs on my discrete eight for if I have a guest come along with an Axe FX or maybe another kind of keyboard or a couple of extra vocal mics if I'm having a group playthrough in here that I want to capture. So I keep those spare. So that's 20 inputs I've got physically. I've got 20 preamps. I've also got SPDIF, which I do make use of, but more on that later. So that's what we're working with. And this may well be similar to what you might have in mind as a drummer or as a recording studio that might want to capture lots of sources. You'll want to have the option to track lots of things at once and then still stream with that. Like that's a really important thing to be able to do. We've got all those sources. What we want to do to start off with, if we're going to be treating everything separately and having access to lots of different audio streams, we're going to need to use some mixers. So my Orion has four mixers on it. So does the discrete eight, but for now, just on the Orion, you will see a lot of these blue channels to start off with. And they've all got names like main left, uh, main left and right, communications left and right, gaming left and right, music left and right. DAW1 left and right and DAW2 left and right. Now, that may seem a bit confusing, but let me break down what's going on here. So when I was talking earlier about the drivers allowing us to have four different stereo playback and record devices within Windows, this is what I'm talking about. We have four devices here. As you can see, playback one and two, playback three and four, playback five and six, playback seven and eight. Now. These are going to these channels on the mixer here. One and two is my main, like, I don't know, I'm editing a video, I'm using Guitar Pro, or I'm just, it's just general computer sounds that I haven't separated out. It's just the normal stuff. Um, then I'll go for communications next because this was the first thing I thought of to separate out because really the big thing is that the guest not hearing themselves. Then this one's kind of a bonus. I don't really need it but it's kind of useful just for separate volume control outside of a game, is to run any game's audio through these channels. Sometimes games don't have great audio controls and it's harder to get into the menus and find them, so I just usually be have that there so I can turn the game up or down. Or more usefully, to be able to not send my game audio to my guest. And then we have music left and right. This isn't DAW music. This is just like seven and eight I use for Spotify, YouTube music. Usually I'm trying to stick to royalty free music if I can. So usually it's lo-fi girl over YouTube music or something like that. Um, and this is really, really useful. Just having my music separated onto this is really handy. Now, what you might not know is that in Windows, you can actually change what programs play through what devices. Even if you don't have a setup like this, where you've got four fake devices inside one device, you can send your audio to different places. For example, any HDMI uh, display that you have will also have a headphone port. You could send one bit of audio to that instead of something else without any other software. It's all built into Windows. It's important that you know how to do this because otherwise none of this makes any sense. So you go to your sound settings, and then you go down to the bottom, there's advanced sound options. So inside that app volume and device preferences, you can see that we can select the output and the input from any device that we want. Now this is how I make the most use out of this driver that Antelope has given me. In Zoom, I actually go ahead and change the outputs and the inputs inside the meeting, which is why it's not set in here, but what would work perfectly here, and this is an absolute mess, I know I have so many devices here, a lot of them are virtual from trying lots of different things, um, but the playback three and four is what I set to be my communications. 
So I would choose that as my output. I would just do it for both of these Zoom things. My music, I was saying that it was meant to be going through seven and eight. Um, this is something a bit more advanced and I am gonna go into detail with that. So the reason why we have channels one through eight being our operating system audio is because that's all that Windows has access to unless you get the advanced beta driver, which you can gain access to all 24 channels, but you really don't need access to that many channels inside Windows. Eight is more than enough in these four stereos. So that's just why my DAW then starts channels nine and 10 and 11 and 12. I use these two outputs essentially to have a normal mix and then a streamer slash guest mix. Or I could use the second mix as just a metronome and then I can mute that for one of those mixes. The cool method that I use to capture this in Cubase is that I actually use the control room, which is essentially like another set of controls after your project mix down and buses and mixer and everything. It's another set of devices which you are your monitoring devices and all sorts of things. So inside Cubase, I have a bunch of outputs set up. Basically, I have nothing in the actual stereo output because I don't actually send out of the mixer's output. This output here doesn't actually technically go anywhere except for just being captured for mix downs. I use the control room, the main control room output here. It's called the main out and that goes to nine and 10, which I'm referring to inside my antelope as DAW1. What I then have is a bunch of Q mixes, which I can do certain different things with, uh, but essentially Q mix one is that 11 and 12. And the reason I do that is because I want to be able to send a mix with or without metronome, which I've got access to there. I can also build different mixes by using Q mixes, I, or I can just simply send my stereo output to QMix1 and then just have a different volume or a different level of click track. That allows me to play along to a click and my audience not to hear the click, for example. Or I can build an entire different mix. And the thing I love is that I can actually have my favorite mastering chain inside the QMix as well. So that if I'm building a different mix, it still sounds glued and nice and it's not clipping but uh, because I'm not sending through the stereo out where I do a bunch of master bus stuff, I can still build that. I just copy my plugins, whatever master strip I may have there. That's how I'm getting my DAW stuff into my interface. I'm using Mixer 2 to monitor because Mixer 1 has a reverb on it. It's just a really great monitoring mixer because of that reverb and it's the only one to have it. So. I really recommend using this mixer for, for tracking mixes. And in this instance, I run all of my drum channels through this mixer, and then this mixer then goes off essentially to the monitoring and, and recording mixes. It's a bit more complicated than that, and I'm gonna go into that process next, but I'm just gonna continue talking through the mixer setup. So mixer two is what I hear. Mixer three will be what my audience or my guest hears. This is that secondary mix. So this is why my voice is live here and only my DAW music is live. But for example, I could have the music on for you, the audience, or, and you know, and make sure that the game is on, but you could be like, hey, your voice is a bit loud or whatever, but I don't want to hear my voice. So I, it's all the same channels as you can see. I've set it up in exactly the same way and you can put anything you want on these mixes. It's totally, it's totally doable. Let's talk about the signal flow of how that works. I'm gonna to go to the routing tab. We have here quite a graphical representation of what we can send from an input to an output. If I click on an input from any of my 12 preamps, you can see where they're going. This might look a bit crazy, but computer record is what Cubase has access to. So what we do is we send our monitoring mixer. I send that to the first pair of recording outputs so that that is how a stream can hear what I hear. And then I also send that out to my headphones and my monitors. As you can see, my headphone one, headphone two, monitor A are all receiving that mixer. That's how I'm listening to it. Then that second mixer, in here it's called mix three, but my audience or my guest mixer 
is going to be going to computer record three and four. And this is what allows OBS to hear whatever I'm hearing. So anything I hear on mixer one will go to computer record one and two. Anything that comes through mixer three will go to that output. I'll set that up in OBS and you can have a look. Let's say that this is now our talking scene. I'll set these up and I have these available in all all of my uh, scenes I have this I have access to this so there's antelope one and two as you can see not hearing anything because right now I don't want to hear my own voice back but I'm also I'm recording all of these on my secondary computer I will set up antelope three and four and then I'll plug that into three and four and you can now see this is jumping up and down. I would only ever want to send one of these at a time to the stream, but now I can choose which one I'm using depending on which workflow I'm doing. Or if you want to be more organized than me, you can go ahead and set up different scenes for different scenarios and then choose which one of these is even inside it in the first place. But I tend to multi-use scenes for lots of different things, so I just keep them both in and usually forget and quickly switch it around in the last minute. Um, it's a, it, it's an organization thing really. But yeah, so you're now hearing the Antelope 3-4 mix. This is being recorded by the other recording machine through the other interface. And essentially then if I were to play any music through this, for example, I press play here, you'll now be hearing my voice plus that music. It might be a bit loud in this state, so I'll turn it down a bit. But again, me, I've got the speakers off at the moment for a cleaner recording, but I would just be hearing the music. This is the first step of how to build an awesome stream, because obviously through the stream, I would only be sending three and four, but now I can not hear my own voice back and you can hear my voice. I actually have an extra awesome tip that I'm gonna show you here. It's a bit advanced, but I'll explain why it's there first. So, what I realized early on was that I didn't want to just have these only these two mixes. I actually realized that when I'm streaming, I want to have a stream starting soon screen or a be right back screen. Um, so either a countdown or a BRB or some other essentially silent scene where I'm just doing stuff in here, I'm checking things out, but the stream is getting ready, or I wanna turn the mics off and take a break, but I actually wanna continue talking to my guests. I realized the only way that I could do that was to essentially work out a third capture method, which would just be very limited sounds. And I decided that I would use one of Voice Meter's programs for this because it's practically impossible to screw up. Um, there's a couple of options that they provide. They provide this thing called VB cable, which is essentially a virtual cable. Um, you send one program into it and out it comes another, which is useful, but only for this task. Or they offer an, a hi-fi version of that, which, which essentially is a better sounding version of that, but you have to be more careful with sample rates. I only use a single sample rate across my whole system all the time. I only ever work in 48 kilohertz at 24 bits, so I use that. But there's this little hidden trick inside Windows where we can take a audio device and we can listen to it through another audio device. This is designed for if you wanna hear your recording input on a laptop or something, you've plugged in a music player and you want to hear it as well as send it out of the computer, but we can hijack that and use it for a really cool thing. So, you'll see this hi-fi cable output here. So here's some lo-fi music I'm playing right now through YouTube Music. So I'm playing this lo-fi music through Chrome at the moment. I tend to run Chrome through uh, the music channels. So you'll see here that Chrome is going to VB Hi-Fi Music 4824. It's just what I've called the VB Audio Hi-Fi Cable. If we find that Hi-Fi Cable, the VB Audio Cable or Hi-Fi Cable, and go to the properties and click on Listen, I've turned that on to then listen to that device through my musical outputs. So what's happening is only the music or anything going through 
computer playback 7 and 8 comes into the virtual cable, which will have its own dedicated digital output, and then it will go through to my musical channels where I can then control it in my normal environment. This is all so that I can have that digital cable. Let me show you. Let's get an audio source. Let's say that this isn't gonna be our scene. This isn't gonna be our talking scene. This will be our starting soon scene. You may not know this, but when you're making streaming stuff happen, you will use a lot of the time browser sources from something like Stream Elements or Stream Labs. Basically, these provide you with cloud-based visualizations and you can set things up in your browser. It makes things really easy. So I use that. I've just gone ahead and copied my URL for one of my overlays and this will be my countdown overlay. So that's quite a simple process of just putting your URL into here and then setting your height and your width. And then basically the important part of this is using your audio control via OBS because what I'm aiming to do actually is because I'm capturing my audio from a separate device. I want to listen to anything that OBS is capturing like these sound effects whenever someone follows or subscribes. I actually need to be listening to that out of OBS and not sending anything through the program that I'm not hearing. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. So here's my stream starting soon scene, uh, the base element of it. I pop a clock here that I've got a video file for that's not loaded in at the moment, but um, essentially that is a video file for a 10 minute countdown clock. Um, and then this is a video file that's played through all through the cloud. So none of this is actually on my computer at all. This all plays for a URL and that's how all of the latest tip information is all um, basically happening just throughout stream elements, reading all that data for me and spitting it out visually, which is really sick. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on my audio and this is coming from Chrome. This is YouTube music playing Lo-Fi Girl. We're hearing it because it's listening through to the interface. So that means that we can capture it and know what we're capturing and we can get the volume right from the start. But also it means that we can capture it on its own. So I'll make an audio input capture and I'm going to call it VB Cable Hi-Fi. And then I'll choose my Hi-Fi cable output. And here it is. That is now only stuff that is going through that device is getting captured here. Even though I can capture a whole mix of other things going on, this just means that that's now going through the program, um, which is super, super handy. The key to making this work is by basically allowing or not allowing audio monitoring. So in order to do that, we go to the advanced audio properties here, and then we can actually change the audio monitoring of any of these channels. So the VB cable, I don't want to monitor. I'm already monitoring it before the fact and separately. So we're not going to touch that. But my countdown scene, because I allowed myself to control the audio via OBS, I can now monitor this and I can choose to either only monitor it or I can hear it and it can go to stream. But because when I hear it, I capture that and send it to stream, I only want to be monitoring it. So I'll turn that on. The important thing is to make sure that the actual output that you're monitoring with is that device. If you're wanting this to work through this like very limited stage setup, this will allow you to basically have any sound effect coming from any of your browser sources, anything OBS only, will come through that digital cable. This is sort of the base level setup, which I added in last but I think this is good to add in early because it's really really helpful to not have to think about silencing or unmuting yourself on any of the antelope stuff you can continue to set things up and have conversations with guests uh, while the music and sound effects and alert boxes just play through so as you'll see the music's coming through channels seven and eight here which on this mixer is music left and music right this will also capture those streaming sounds because we're monitoring through OBS. So let me just trigger an alert for you. If a follower happens, you'll see that that ding just happened and you heard it 
and the stream will have heard it as well because what happened was the ding happened inside this countdown scene because I set it to only monitor it then went through OBS's output which we set to be the virtual cable and then I heard the ding because I'm monitoring the virtual cable through the Windows listening tool that's it's really complicated but I hope you understand why that's the process that's happening and you're starting to get used to why certain things are limited and why we set up these sort of junctions in order to capture these things as they happen. Again, the goal of this is so that we can have the most fun possible and not have any limitations thrown on us while we're actually working with the DAW and all this stuff is built in to the sort of background. Things that allow us to just have fun. You can do that with anything, but I'm just talking about how I integrate it with my, with my gear. Let's talk a bit about my voice and how you can hear it. Do you remember I was telling you about the AFX, the audio interface effects that we have access to that are outside of any DAW? Let me show you that. So with the AFX, the way that it works inside these interfaces is essentially they're like a whole bunch of hardware racks. You can do whatever the heck you want with them and how you use them is up to you. So I send all of my preamps and my ADAP preamps through them consecutively until I've hit 20 inputs. So as you'll see, it, AFX in here is technically an output because it comes into the preamp and it goes out to something. So you'll see on this AFX in line, we're going out one through 12 to AFX one through 12. And then these ADAT inputs then continue on the AFX hardware rack inputs. This allows me to have essentially you know, a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of effects on all of those things. Let me look at the channel for my desk talkback. This is what you're listening to. What we have is auto tune. I run this first because I might want to do some funny auto tune things. I might want to use it creatively, or I'll use these channels to have a singer come along and actually have some auto tune built into the microphone with no latency. They don't ever see me use it in the DAW, but you know, they may know it's there just to, just to give them that extra pitch comfort. But I don't have to record this. I record dry and wet at the same time because I can send things to multiple places. I throw it through a nice preamp. I do some EQing on it, and then I throw it through an 1176 because why the hell not? It sounds nice, it sounds 3D. I, I love the sound of this vocal chain. I've been tweaking it and using basically the same thing for a long time now and uh, I really like it because I turn on my computer and I know it's there. I can very quickly jump into a Zoom meeting and quickly just make sure that my voice is live here and I'll be set to go. So you can feed any mixer through this same setup. AFX outs are now here. Consider these to be a new input. So through this microphone into preamp two, it's now gone into AFX two, that's here. Now AFX out two is now considered an input and we can throw it to something else. This goes to my mixes and it goes to a recording output. So at the moment, I haven't got it set up to actually be recorded by this computer. I've chosen to focus on other channels because I don't ever actually have to record this inside my DAW, but I can quickly change that if I need to by just dragging it to one of my computer record inputs. I would probably throw it onto five and then switch that between the DI or I might do it, you know, somewhere towards the end but usually I'm just not recording that. I've only got 24 to work with. I use four to be able to record my loop back at any point. So it's not my focus, but it's easy to do. But I do throw these into mixers two and three, and you can see that here. So that is then how that makes it to these channels. And that's how you hear it. We've now got the basis to basically talk about how to capture other things, more complicated mixes. I use the interface to mix my entire drum kit and send it out in the same way. And I'm gonna start using the routing matrix to show you how I do that. So, let me show you the routing matrix. Don't be alarmed, it's not as scary as it looks. In, in the initial view, all you're seeing with these green indicators is that a connection is happening here. It's pretty easy. Inputs on the left, outputs on the top. And we just take things from the in to the out. I've always loved in professional studios that you can have 
uh, Bantam patch bays to send anything to anywhere. And I've always wanted that kind of a setup. So getting this device allowed me to do that. So let's start by looking at preamps and where they're going. So here's where I'm recording everything that's coming in, all dry, straight from preamp to computer recording. They go out of my ADA output in the same order for this second interface, which again, not necessary for what you're doing, only if you're trying to do what I'm doing, which is have a separate machine recording all of this. This is it feeding all of those AFX channels, and then it's not really going anywhere else, which is why you can only see those. So the AFX inputs, this is what that looks like for me. It's the 12 preamps to the first set of AFX, 12 channels of the AFX. Then it's my eight, at eight channels from, this could be like your Octopre, or for me, it's the discrete eight, whatever kind of, uh, you know, additional preamps you can have. You might have more. You might have like another eight, uh, eight ats, but I use these actually to be able to send back the computer playback sounds from the other interface because I just don't have any more, but I have used this successfully with 16 channels of ADAT input before. But then let's talk about feeding the mixers. So my AFX of all of my inputs, one through 20, go into my mixer, my first mixer. So that brings them all up here. I then build a mix using the AFX. I've then played through and, and done a whole bunch of processing on all of these mics. Obviously not while I've been playing. In order to actually set this mix up, what I've actually done is recorded the dry audio and then I've re-patched the inputs of all those AFX. Instead of coming from the live preamps, I've gone and taken the computer playbacks. I've just taken like a whole bunch of them in a row. Um, I, I will have re redone all of my kind of playback outputs that go to the mixes and I'll have sent them directly into the AFX. So for example, computer play, I would have done everything from 13 up to 24 or however many channels I needed and I just would have replaced these inputs. That way I can do a digital sound check. So that would mean that the recorded kick drum in would go to that channel. Um, and this is essentially a silent sound check. I'm not gonna go through that whole process right now because it took quite a long time to do. Um, I did it on a live stream actually, which should be linked here. Um, you can see things like that happen on my stream channels all the time. But essentially, yeah, I've built this, I built this sound and I've really, really liked the way it's come out. And what I've then done is a bit of rooting magic. I've sent this whole mix into a bus compressor and then it hits my board. I can then record that as a stereo track, which I've been doing lately. I've actually been recording the, the, the tracking mix alongside all of the dry inputs, which is really cool for making loops and just immediately having a, a drum mix without overloading a DAW session. It's very, very cool. Here's what I'm talking about. This is how you send a mixer to something inside the rooting matrix. So mixer one, is just going to AFX in 31 and 32. I just put it at the back end of my AFX board because I knew I just wanted to get it out the way. So here's my master bus. Um, it turns out I actually have a tape machine on it uh, as well. I really love the sound of it, but um, I, I gotta remember to turn that off. But yeah, it's, a, it's an SSL bus compressor. Sounds awesome. Really, it's kind of a bit more of a limiter in how it's working in that I'm, uh, I'm just making sure that things aren't peaking, but it's pulling the whole drum mix together. I love the sound of it. We take that AFX output from AFX out 31 and 32 down here, which I've called drum left and drum right. I know this is all very messy because I've done so many different things with it, but this is where it connects to mixes channel two, goes to a couple of channels here, same channels on channel three. So this is how the whole drum kit comes in. This mixer goes through a bus compressor and then pops in on drum left and right. If I go play drums right now, you'll hear this really nice drum mix that happens. So if I turn on that drum mix and the drum talk back for my audience mix on mixer three that you're hearing, that would also be now going to three and four in my OBS because of that, you'll see how that sounds. And I'll flip between this view and the actual mixer view. So yeah, then I can basically just have a play 
and not have to worry about what a DAW is doing or anything. Here's what it looks like in Mixer. And then I can show you a bit about how that looks inside AFX as well. For example, just having a look at the master bus here. So this is all really, really great for me because I can now basically jam along to music that I'm listening to on the drums and not even have to run a DAW at all, which is awesome. I really love that. That allows me to do my playback streams. Uh, it allows me to do play alongs. I really love the fact that there's no latency with that. Whenever I build a mix inside Cubase and I set up a whole bunch of different channels in here, I always get some latency because USB has latency to start with. CPUs take longer to actually process stuff for me. I've never managed to get underneath like a comfortable six or seven milliseconds. And then I usually add a couple on top of that with plugins. And also it really helps because I can record these tracking mixes and I can also record the dry signals separately. So for example, I can take my drum mix and I can throw that into a couple of recording channels to throw into the DAW alongside all the dry audio. And I can do this just by mapping it to the correct output. So you have to manage your channels, you know, kind of cautiously, but this way you could have um, a little mix for a horn section, for example, on your mix, uh, on your mix one and the horn players can be listening to that and enjoying it, you can go ahead and print that mix. Normally you would need to have some kind of mental setup in order to record things, you know, having lots of actual routing matrices on a massive SSL desk. I have all that functionality in here and I can share it all with the stream because it's all got those digital loopbacks. It really, really is as awesome as it sounds. So once we've got those mixes set up in here, we have we can then send them to our computer recording outputs and then we can access them in OBS. We take mixer two and send it out through computer recording one and two. We take mixer three and send it out through computer record three and four. One, two, three, four. Those four channels are now locked to that. You can also do it in the routing matrix by going to your mixer two output and sending it to comp rec here. I also send it out to my headphones here. It's just a different view of the same thing and then sending it out of computer rec. You can then send it to different places. So here is how, how OBS can see those two mixes. And then it really is just down to what do you want to throw through those mixes? What do you want to listen to and thus your stream be able to hear? So if I'm on headphones, I'm going to be basically just sharing uh, mix one and two, whatever I'm hearing because I won't be afraid of having my voice coming through the headphones. I actually like to hear my own voice. Um, and then I know what I'm hearing is what you're hearing. If I'm on my speakers, I will do it this way around and then you're hearing what I only want you to hear. Or for example, I could still be on headphones um, and have my own voice coming through mixer two being my mix again. So, you know, for example, my, uh, and. I'm recording all of this with a second computer, so I'm going to switch the audio there so that you hear exactly what's coming through this now. So this is now Mixer 2, what you're hearing right now. I might want to hear, for example, my DAW1 mix only, and I might want you to only hear my DAW2 mix. For example, the reason for that might be because I want to hear a metronome. So this is the mix that you're hearing right now that's coming through DAW1, but the same mix could then be coming through DAW2, and as you're now hearing that, that has no metronome to it. This one has it, that one doesn't, because I'm just using DAW1 to have the click on, so I can hear that, and you don't have to listen to that sound at all. Again, Cubase gives me that functionality because I can take these Q mixes and change the click, but there's a lot of different ways you can change the mixes 
and have different different things for different people. Now, where it gets interesting and where the big benefit of this setup is, is if I have a guest. Let's say that this is now my guest's mix and me and the stream are hearing this. Number one, I now have to be on headphones because I want to hear my voice. Um, I want to make sure the level is right. So here is where having the communications channels computer play three and four is so useful. So let's say I'm on a Zoom call with a friend and they're talking through here. I'm hearing it and thus the stream's hearing it because I'm making sure the stream is hearing mix one and two. But they're not hearing themselves back and they're not going to hear whatever I, whatever I don't want them to hear, they won't hear. But they're hearing me. Um, at the moment, they're also hearing my drums and my, <laughs> and my drum talkback mic. It really depends if I'm teaching a lesson, I'm going to want them to hear my drum talkback mic and my drum kit through the AFX. This is what I use for my drum lessons. Don't even have to start a DAW. I can just turn on my computer, log into Zoom, and I know that I can just turn these channels on and, and off I go. I can send them whatever DAW things they want, but the important thing is they're not hearing their voice back because three and four are closed. If we're playing a game together, I will mute the game so that they don't hear the game audio. But because I've got seven and eight on, if I've got background music, assuming that I'm using a program that doesn't have uh, noise suppression on, which and that's really important to turn off, especially if you're trying to do musical stuff over Zoom, only if you're sure that there's no chance of echo. Uh, because this is where the advanced stuff... I'm really glad that these programs now have those modes built in. Zoom has original audio for musicians, or original sound for musicians. Discord, you can just turn off the noise suppression, crisp, and other stuff. And uh, there's a lot of different things that have those protocols that you can then disable. So then they would hear the backing music that's coming through. I'll go ahead and play that again. So here you're seeing my voice. It's healthy with the music. Anything that's happening in OBS is also being captured and going through those channels. That's what the VB cable was doing. So, but even without the VB cable, by making OBS monitor through the the same that that same channel, whether it be the virtual cable or just going straight to that musical output. In this in this case, it doesn't matter because we were just trying to share it with either ourselves or our guest but by having the cable it means we can separate this out this means that they'll hear, hear any streaming sound that happens so we can also have more sources in in these places not just our countdown alert sounds but we can also have things like blurps so blurp is a twitch integration we can use which can essentially allow our users to make sounds that we might want to share with our guests as well so what we do is we put in our browser URL. I've done it just above so you can't see it and hack me. Um, and then I've clicked control audio by OBS. And now I have, well, I've called it blep, but you know, just like we did with the countdown, we're going to go ahead and monitor that through OBS only. It's not going to come straight out. It's only going to go through that source because we're controlling the flow. I can then add an applause through my channel points. And as you can see, that visually and audio-wise comes up and has its own mixer and goes through that VB cable. You saw the level go up alongside our lo-fi music there. But again, there's no voice because the only things connected to that are those programs. OBS and Google Chrome or Spotify or whatever are the only things going through them. So if we're now in the scene where we're chatting, we'll just remove those elements. We don't need them in here. So we'll remove those elements from our talking scene. And now all we have is our camera and our two audios. So if we put the blurp scene in here as well, if I make the applause happen, this will now work in the normal mode. Well. We might want to move it to something like a lesson, if it's more like it, But we can hear it because OBS is monitoring it. We're not monitoring any of the actual outputs because we don't want to double send it. We have to be careful with that. But yeah, the blurps are coming through the monitor output, which is going through the virtual cable, giving us the output for our stream starting soon and our countdowns and our silent streaming mode. And then it's going to seven and eight, which is allowing it to be heard in this mode. This is uh, coming down this channel here, which again, 
I can now control how loud the music is for my guests. And they can also react to those. Like in this amazing clip that happened uh, with a stream I did with my friend Drusif, where we ended up being unable to work for over an hour because my whole stream decided to prank us with this sound effect for over an hour and we just couldn't stop laughing. Do I need to turn blurps off <laughs> at this point? <laughs> or is this fucking amazing? Pizza time. <laughs> Pizza time. <laughs> Pizza time. <laughs> and so as convoluted as it is, moments like that just cannot happen without having a setup like this. Just getting to the point where that is all able to be captured is a lot of work, but moments like that just wouldn't have been possible without having a setup like this going. And I don't know of any other way I could do this as easily as I do. So I'm really happy that I have it set up this way. I hope it kind of makes sense in how to set it up like that. I now want to talk a bit about the two computer setup and why having a second interface as opposed to an ADAT expanding preamp is as cool as it is. So here's the control panel for the Discrete 8 Pro. Um, this is my second interface. And I'm showing you the mixer on this computer, but it's not actually plugged into this computer. It's plugged into my laptop. I'm able to control everything of all my interfaces across any computer on the network, which is awesome. But the USB stream of this is actually going straight to my laptop, which, while I don't have a video recording of it, is recording the dry mic here, the wet mic, and then both of those mixers we were talking about. So the way that we're doing that is that we I have 16 ADAT lines running to the discrete from the Orion as well as two ADAT lines running from the discrete to the Orion. I've got 16 channels bi-directional going on and I'm clocking that via BNC word clock cable. You can clock just via ADAT but I find it's not as reliable. Um, the discrete is cool because it's got three word clock outputs so I use that kind of as the word clock distributor and then the Orion it just has the one in and the one out for BNC, so I just send it out from there because I, I think it's best to clock from your main device. For the current recording setup I have going on, I am sending out of my ADA out my preamps plus the AFX out of my talkback as a temporary channel one thing because I've just replaced the DI that was at the beginning of my preamp chain for this video. I'm sending the my affected vocal and then channel 2 is my unaffected vocal and then I'm ignoring everything else up until ADATs 13, 14, 15 and 16 because it's naturally nicely at the end of my group of 12 preamps and then that's sending over those last four channels of ADAT those mixer outputs and then inside the discrete which is currently recording in my routing here I've got this is the discrete routing matrix. It looks exactly the same. I'm taking my ADAT in and I am recording in this. I've set the first four channels similarly to record the two mixes and then I can use the mixes for the same kind of global recording mixes on the other machine. That allows me to create a mix on one machine and record it slash stream it on another, which is super useful if I want to stream with two computers. So those four, same idea, except I'm recording the Orion's monitoring mixer coming in on those first, on these ADATs 13 and 14 into record one and two. And then I'm recording the second mixer, you know, the the audience or guest mixer into those next recording inputs. And then from there on out, all the rest of the ADATs are just recording one to one. So based on what I had before, that affected mic is here and that unaffected mic is here. And then the rest of this is all the drums, the preamps from the Orion, and then the preamps internally continue from there. So essentially on both computers and both interfaces, I'm looking at the same channel list, two stereo mixes for loopback, and then 20 live inputs. 
either affected or unaffected at my choosing. So I could take anything and record it a certain amount of times, however I wanted. It allows for an insane amount of choice when it comes to what you record and how you record it. Really, the sky is the limit in terms of like what kind of environment you might want to do. For me, that works super well because right now I wanted to be able to show you what was going on in Cubase without actually recording inside my Cubase. And one of the things I've done with this setup is when I made my Melian Drum Academy videos, I had a whole bunch of teaching materials set up inside a Cubase project. And I wanted to make loops of, you know, being able to play along with these exercises I'd made. I had a really nice drum mix inside that DAW session. I then set up with these two interfaces. It was the first time I'd really done it. I was monitoring and recording the outputs from one computer session into another computer, which was like a tape machine. So, it, so the click was coming out of the Orion, out of a Cubase output, going to the other interface via the ADAT, and then going to its own recording channel. A similar process was happening for my guitar tracks. They were going to their own channel. And then I wasn't sent, and then I think I was sending the drums mixed into another stereo. And then I was sending all of the dry mics as well into the recording inputs of the other machine, this same laptop that I'm using here. And that allowed me to be completely free with how I manipulated the playback machine, which was also doing the monitoring, but I managed to record everything absolutely fine, including my talkback mics. I think I had 24 inputs running at a time with that. It was, it was pretty nuts. I was maxing out my channel count, but it meant that I could make some really cool video content and not worry about the fact that I would otherwise have to keep starting and stopping my recording project, which would mean I'd have to keep starting and stopping my videos to keep them in line. Especially if sometimes, like I've started to do, you might want to use timecode to actually sync your videos with your audio. What I actually have inside here is a timecode output inside my Cubase, which you can't hear. I would never want you to hear SMTPE timecode. It's horrible. But essentially this audio signal, I can jam that into my recording device and then that can allow me to have timecode syncing, which is amazingly useful because it means I can record a playback to a song, I can record along to a song, and all my video will always line up with whatever part of the song it is, depending on what the timecode is inside Cubase. That routing example is this. What I have is in timecode, the only reason timecode's coming out of there is because there's an SMTPE generator, I've been playing with the offset of the hours to make it line up well with my video editor. I don't think you should have to do that, but I've linked it to the transport because I want, when I press play, I want that to then be perfectly in time with what's happening inside my DAW. I've set my time code up to be the same as how I like to record. Usually I'll set that to 60 frames per second because I like to record in 60. And now my time code will basically this is what's happening in the other machine, although I probably won't be using its timecode. I am able to, uh, I, I would be able to in a more complex project. That timecode generator is on a QMix. It's just a QMix that's called timecode. And that would normally be connected to output 24. Inside the routing matrix, I would take computer, computer play 24 and I would send that out to monitor B. Uh, at the moment, I'm sending it from my an ADAT line because, and I'm double sending it because I didn't know how to do it in stereo. Uh, I didn't want to risk only sending it through the left or the right, so I decided to send it through both and treat it as a mono signal. Um, but this is actually coming from the other computer because it's my recording computer. Essentially then through the monitor B output, I've got a hardwired cable going from that output to my video recorder's audio input where in software I can jam that timecode in later and then everything can just fall into sync. 60% of the time it works every time. So I can quickly switch that from one machine to the other by just changing from computer play 24 to my ADAT 8 from the other machine, the D8 Comp 8, which is what it's called. Again, only access to 8 because the ADAT's a bit limited, but it's not a problem for me. And then just to show you that side of the routing, inside the Discrete 8 Pro, 
My computer play 24 on that machine, very similarly set up, is then going to that 8 at 8, which is how everything works. But I'm also sending just my general audio mixes of the other machine through my Orion so that I can just listen to everything through one set of one set of monitors. And that way I could do playback on either machine, no matter which one I'm streaming or recording from, it's all accessible. So my computer play channels will be going to my mixers inputs and then my mixers outputs will be going out of my ADAT out. And that allows me to then send that ADAT those mixes of whatever I'm listening to, even a similarly complex setup on the other machine could then be streamed in here because it comes in through those ADAT inputs here, one through four. And then I can monitor them on this machine, which is epic. It's here, here is what it looks like, D D8 one and two, and then uh, comp one and two. There's some other nuts things that I have done with this that this gets even crazier. Um, and, and I, I warn you, this does get pretty nuts at this point. So this goes back to a single computer setup. So if I'm playing that music through input seven and eight, I have gone ahead and set up another AFX line. Just I've just been toying with this because I like to have my music that I'm listening to stop when I'm actually working on something. And then as soon as I get back to silently working like drum editing or video editing, when I don't need to listen to something, I want my music to come back. Um, so what I did was I set up a sidechain in here. So what I do is s music seven and eight comes in through uh, this AFX into these channels here, which is the sidechain channels. I can do this from either machine. I can just reroute the input to those channels via ADAT or the internal channel seven and eight. So what I do is I mute seven and eight and I then play it here. But this then has a, this this has a sidechain input which we can set up to be whatever we want it to be. You're now listening to the main monitoring mix. So you can hear this happen in real time. If I take the dry input of my mic here. The moment I start talking, you'll see that the music dies down. The moment I stopped talking, the music came back. Like, how cool is that, you know, just to have that functionality built in. So, you know, when I'm editing this video, I'm going to be using this again. I'm going to be wanting to listen to myself talk and do all that stuff. And then when I go back to clicking and whatever else, I just get this nice radio put back in in the background. Like, you can't tell me that's not cool. So I'm going to go ahead and reset that to comp play, uh, not itself, but the main left and right. There we go. There's a lot of things like that you can do with this. Uh, I, I feel like I'm doing a lot with it, and I know that most people aren't doing as much as I'm doing, but I do still feel like I'm scratching the surface with it. So, but it is allowing me to have an audiovisual experience for myself, my audience, both streaming and recorded, and I can still feel free to record any instrument I want at any time and play different outputs and share them between different people and I don't think anyone else I've seen has worked out how to have the guests in this way because this kind of an audio setup is just nuts and you need a very specific setup for it. For those of you who've made it this far I want you to type a little congratulatory hello Mr. Mustache in the comments and then I'll know that you made it through to the end. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and make another video for how this all works with the Zengo because it's a bit different and I can reference this one in that and I can talk about how I use it in my drum clinics because it's bloody awesome for that. I'm also gonna be talking about how I use it for this keyboard rig because I haven't actually fleshed that out yet but because I've got the, I've actually got the interface on there so that I can use it as a way to blend the live keyboard sound with my laptop as a sound source and a MIDI controller. I'll also be talking about a as of yet undeveloped keyboard rig, which I'm planning to do, which involves turning my laptop into a sound source of its own, being controlled by the Nord, and then how the Zengo will then mix that all into one SPDIF output, and I can throw it over the roof rafters to my main setup to keep my floor nice and tidy. It's just nicer using SPDIF for that because it's a single cable, and then I won't be, I'll also have the mixer built in, and yeah, it's just really cool.
If there's anything I missed or didn't explain very well, then please do leave a comment and ask me for that kind of information. Thank you so much for watching this very long, very nerdy piece of content. I hope you've enjoyed it and I look forward to seeing you in a stream or at a show sometime. Take care.